Frank Herbert's Dune series has received a limited amount of academic attention over the years. Some of these studies tend to examine Dune as a standalone work, and while others do offer a broader look at the Dune series, they can be limited in the attention that they focus on all six books. This is primarily due to the times when these academic studies took place, the publishing of the Dune series itself covering a period from 1963 until 1986. Ecology is easily the main focus of study for Frank Herbert's Dune series, and the one subject which tends to centre most on Dune at the exclusion of the other novels. The study of the series from a psychological and psychoanalytical approach is also popular. Other research includes examining the Dune series from historical, mythological, feminist, and technological viewpoints. Of the research undertaken into Frank Herbert's Dune series, there are perhaps two notable attempts to explore the set of books in their entirety. The first of these works is Donald E. Palumbo's Chaos Theory, Asimov's Foundations and Robots, and Herbert's Dune, which approaches the series as a work which pioneered chaos theory, especially in its handling of ecology and Joseph Campbell's ideas of the monomyth. Palumbo's ideas are fascinating though perhaps a little contrived in respect towards his notions of chaos theory as opposed to systems. Those of us not familiar with a good understanding of systemic thinking and systems design in all its multifaceted forms might be easily persuaded that Frank Herbert did indeed anticipate chaos theory, as Adam Roberts seems to suggest, but ultimately this is not the case. Palumbo's work also has a comparative approach, looking at Herbert's Dune series alongside Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. The premise that Dune has been written as a response to the Foundation trilogy is a theory put forth by other writers, including the likes of C. N. Manlove and Timothy O'Reilly. The second notable complete study is Frank Herbert by William F. Tupons, which focuses on the entire Dune series and investigates the books as polyphonic novels. Both Palumbo and Tuponce offer as limited but insightful views of the Dune series, but are nevertheless the only real attempts to look at Herbert's novels as a collective whole. Frank Herbert by Timothy O'Reilly is an excellent introduction to the author's overall work, but being published some five years before Herbert's death, is only able to examine the initial Dune trilogy as it was then conceived, and therefore cannot offer a complete insight into the overall series. More for the fan than to provide an in-depth study is the recently published compendium of papers exploring the science of Dune. This collection, rather than any in-depth analysis, seeks to ask if the science and technology behind Herbert's Duneverse as it is referred to, has any real merit. A wide number of articles about the Dune series seldom look at the story as a whole. Both Susan Stratton and C. N. Manlove provide ecological examinations of Dune, via comparisons to other contemporary ecologically themed science fiction works. The Messiah and the Greens, The Shape of Environmental Action in Dune and Pacific Edge, by Susan Stratton, questions the ecologically differing approaches between Herbert's Dune and Kim Stanley Robinson's Pacific Edge, asking how these texts reflect the ecological knowledge of the writers and their times. In addition, Stratton also examines the way that writers are able to depict their interconnectivity of human culture and the environment. The basis for Stratton's analysis comes from Ursula K. Le Guin's Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction, published in Dancing at the Edge of the World, and Joseph Meeker's The Comic Mode from his work on the comedy of survival, Studies in Literary Ecology. Stratton here sees Dune as being very much a product of its times reflecting the demands of publishers and readers alike. In essence, she suggests that Herbert's Dune is heroic in Le Guin's terms, and tragic from Meeker's, reflecting the desires of Golden Age science fiction readership and editors. Conversely, Pacific Edge is realistic from Le Guin's viewpoint and comic in Meeker's. Stratton sees Dune as being primarily a story about death, with Robinson's tale reflecting the opposite and focusing on life. Pacific Edge however is viewed as an inheritor of the growing awareness of ecological issues, and works that have pursued this interest in opposition to hegemonic dominance. Stratton therefore examines the relationship between the two novels, viewing Pacific Edge as an anti-Dune novel, and that Dune itself portrays a simplified ecology which is compromised by the heroic focus of the narrative. <laughs>
Stratton concludes that Dune was an important first step for a generation of science fiction readers who needed to learn the fundamentals of ecology, whereas Robinson's Pacific Edge is better suited to a more ecologically aware modern readership who seek answers to the environmental problems that have befallen humanity in recent times. The study of Dune in Science Fiction 10 Explorations by C. N. Manlove also forms a comparative approach, only here the subject matter for comparison is Brian Aldiss's Hothouse. Hothouse is also the topic of the previous chapter in his series of explorations. Stratton's comparison focuses mainly on social Darwinism, the economics of ecology, and the aspects of Meeker's and Le Guin's viewpoints applied to Dune and Pacific Edge's ecological approach. Manlove's study looks at a comparison of the physical and the mental, and the nature of concealment in both Dune and Hothouse. Indeed, as Manlove points out, these differences spring from the fact that where Hothouse could be said to concern itself with the body, the medium of Dune is the mind. Manlove's approach inspects the episodic isolation of the individual characters' minds in Dune, contrasting it with the arbitrary structure and physicality of Hothouse. With Dune, Manlove finds that it is the primacy of mind that serves to fulfil the action in a world where reality is said to be dialectical. Manlove's study of Frank Herbert's Dune focuses primarily on the first novel, and although he does briefly discuss the expansion of themes in the later books, his study was completed before the publication of Herbert's last book in the series. In R. J. Ellis's Frank Herbert's Dune and the Discourse of Apocalyptic Ecologism in the United States, Dune is approached from a much more in-depth ecological viewpoint, taking the time to dwell upon the individual works of ecological importance contemporary with or predating Herbert's work on Dune. Ellis shares the viewpoint with Stratton that Paul's representation as a hero compromises the coherence of the book's treatment of power as a theme, and therefore also its treatment of ecology as a tool of statecraft. He also shows an awareness of the ecological influences on Frank Herbert, especially those of Rachel Carson and Paul Bigelow Sears, and notes the pseudo-biblical language which Carson uses as being tantamount to dystopic science fiction. In fact, as Ellis examines the apocalyptic treatment of ecology by authors such as Carson and Sears, he argues that this approach sets out to generate anxiety as a means to widen the ecological lobby. Ellis views that this apocalyptic attitude that Carson demonstrates by generating concern for an impending ecological disaster is symptomatic of the key features of late 1950s and early 1960s ecological representations of humanity's environmental future. That is not to say that Ellis feels Carson's work was ineffective. The opposite is the case. He does feel that Dune is very much in the mode of this kind of writing, as too is Herbert's other main ecological influence, Paul Sears. Dune's apocalyptic environment can be seen as mapping fictionally the discursive modes within which the ecological debate about America's future was being conducted. Ellis's study of these ecological writings' influence on Herbert notes that neither Carson nor Sears provide any realistic solutions to their respective pending ecological disasters. Instead, they are seeking advocacy of a personal stewardship approach to environmental management, whilst trying to stay away from the necessity of state intervention. The result is like Herbert, both authors consider a holistic approach to ecology, but are not fully conversant in the political ramifications this may entail. Intriguingly, Ellis proposes that where both Sears and Carson are attempting to instruct the public at large in ecological necessities, Herbert is able to explore the political ramifications of apocalyptic ecologism much more freely. Although Ellis views the combination of the theme of a disastrous hero being important to Dune in that it rescues the novel from what he calls banality, it is the continuing focus on this at the detriment of the ecological theme in later novels that makes them inferior and reduced to a mere cosmic costume drama. Marie Noel Zinder's The Moipo of Leto II in Herbert's Atreides saga makes the approach of providing a psychological analysis of the character of Leto II, the god emperor of Dune. As such, the focus of Zinder's work is centred primarily on this protagonist, who takes centre stage in Children of Dune and God Emperor of Dune. Zinder's approach is to examine Leto II's character 
based on the work of French psychoanalyst Didier Anzu, and to apply his ideas of le moi po to Herbert's fictional character. Didier's theory of le moi po, the skin ego, presents the idea of a relationship between the skin of a human as a kind of physical envelope for the body, and a psychic skin which functions in a similar manner in relationship to the ego. Zinder's suggestion is that Leto II's behaviour is similar to that of the autistic impulse, while other aspects of his sexual character, or it should be said, rather the lack of it, suggest strong Oedipal connotations. Zinder looks at Leto II in this light, as he literally has a second skin provided by his subsequent metamorphosis, when he joins with the symbiotic sand trout. Zinder also examines the relationship between power and insanity, making comparisons to Frank Herbert's The White Plague, a story which follows the murderous revenge of a scientist taking his own reprisal upon the IRA via a viral plague fatal only to women. Zinder goes on to identify the use of other memory by various characters and the Atreides themselves as being in the tradition of the psychotic family novel. Ultimately, Zinder views Leto II's symbiosis with the skin of a sandworm as being a monstrous moi po, a powerful metaphor for their psychosis and cravings for despotism in the universe which the Atreides inhabit and shape. Zinder concludes that it is through the story of Dune that Frank Herbert demonstrates how psychoanalysis can serve the needs of literary fiction and creates new myths based upon the exploring of the human consciousness. In Susan Maclean's A Psychological Approach to Fantasy in the Dune series, the suggestion is made that the enormous popularity of the Dune series is down to the use of popular and recognised tropes from fantasy literature and fairy tales. By containing myths within the text, especially that of the Oedipus myth and its association with Freudian psychology, Maclean takes the stance that Herbert is able to address the anxieties and aspirations of the adolescent males who still make up a large proportion of science fiction readership. Maclean associates the use of myth in the Dune series as being similar to the use of fairy tales and their function to instruct children in the social interactions, taboos, and fears of their given society. In this sense Maclean cites the excellent study of fairy tales, Bruno Bettelheim's The Uses of Enchantment. However, Maclean also views this use of myth in the manner of the psychologist and psychoanalyst, which is usually an approach which relies heavily on iconotropy, which is the deliberate or accidental misinterpretation of myth, and which has a tendency to correlate dreams with myth. That is not to say that this is an inappropriate approach to the use of myth by Frank Herbert in the Dune series, as he is himself guilty of using iconotropy to create his own form of monomyth. This is nowhere more apparent in Maclean's work when she says, like Oedipus himself, Paul atones for his incestuous and patricidal impulses with blindness, exile, and death. Oedipus displays neither incestuous nor patricidal impulses, and this interpretation of the myth is surely based in psychoanalytical iconotropy, which will seemingly be forever associated with Freud. His blindness, exile, and death may correlate to the tragic end of Oedipus's life, but can also in fact be seen as part of the monomyth or even Lord Raglan's ritualistic steps that the hero undertakes in the life of his own myth. See chapter 3. Maclean acknowledges that the importance of fantasy themes, or myths, diminish throughout the Dune series, and views Dune as the enactment of the triumph of Oedipal wish fulfilment, whereas Dune Messiah examines the guilt that results from acting out such fantasies. Of more interest is Maclean's identification of the use of sex as a weapon and a tool of statecraft in the Dune series, and it is especially unfortunate that her study was undertaken before the completion of Heretics of Dune and Chapter House Dune, where this theme is developed to its conclusion. Similarly, Maclean's take on the dualistic archetypes presented in the Dune series examines them from a sexual perspective, looking at the potentially incestuous relationships within the Bene Gesserit breeding program and the Atreides family. This study ultimately revolves around a feminist psychological viewpoint which suggests that the fear of sexuality in the Dune series is the equivalent of the fear of women, where the most fearful women are mothers. This is combined with application of divinity towards the male characters of Paul and Leto II, which represent the irrational. Maclean's conclusion is that like fairy tales, 
This combination allows the reader of the Dune series to learn to accept these facets of sexuality and the irrational into their daily lives, providing both a coping mechanism and a means of acceptance. Prana and the Presbyterian Fixation, Ecology and Technology in Frank Herbert's Dune Tetralogy by Leonard Skigage, also examines the first four books of the Dune series in relation to myth. Shkigais, however, is looking at what Herbert viewed as the intrinsic and problematic cultural myth at the heart of modern America. This myth is what Frank Herbert called the Presbyterian fixation, essentially the desire to predict and foresee any problems and provide definite solutions to them with technology. Shkigais views Paul's prescience and concern over the forthcoming jihad and the biological renewal of the human race as being analogous in some respects to the politician's obsession with his new frontier of great society, or even Isaac Asimov's unswerving belief that the scientists can solve all technological problems by creating more technology. Skigage sees Paul's prescience as being unproductive to the point where it develops into an obsessive fixation on the future, noting that Herbert himself had seen this as a metaphor for the practices of large corporations. Skigage's approach examines a number of motifs and influences upon Herbert, including the idea of the Jungian collective unconscious and Alfred Korzybski's general semantics. Looking at Leto II's succession from Paul, he believes that the God Emperor's approach is based upon a tripartite solution designed to step away from the failures of his father. These are as follows. A grasp of intuitions emanating from his Jungian unconscious. Facility with a Zen precognitive, egoless awareness of the present moment as a fluid matrix of possibilities and an adaptation of the Chinese respect for chance. Shkigaj correctly identifies Leto II's tyranny as an oppression which will remove humanity's need for a messianic figure and instead instill a need for the species to take a collective responsibility for its own fate. Shkigaj is insightful when he correctly identifies humanity who in Dune through the Fremen are presented as geomorphic agents, as part of their environments and ecosystems. In doing so, Skigaj realises that Leto II is in fact an interim ecological manager engaged in vision management. Skigaj also studies the nature of the Yogin Prana in the Dune series, seeing the spice melange as a metaphor for both the vital principle of life that Prana represents, especially in an ecological sense. Contrary to Zinder's study of the Mwapo of Leto II, Skigaj views the God Emperor's symbiosis with the skin of the sand trout as representative of the Zen directive to become the problem itself, to live the problem in all its manifestations, personal, social and environmental. Prana is identified through yoga and Zen as a means by which Leto II is able to control rather than repress his inner collective unconscious, and is representative of an ideal of self-control based upon a dynamic and necessitous fusion of the internal and external. In comparison, Skigaj views the Ixians as being a perfect example of the Presbyterian fixation with technology to solve any and all problems. Their no technology is separate and outside of the natural universe, yet a vast instrument for change. Their insular and mechanical attitude to their problems is the polar opposite to Leto II's approach of a holistic vision of interrelatedness. Skigaj concludes that Paul and Alia's inability to fixate on the present results in their failure to develop the wisdom and long-sightedness to adapt to their environmental needs of Arrakis and the Fremen. It is through Leto II's ability to live in an infinite present, governed by his own prana vitality, that he is able to extend this balance outward to include the society and environment of Dune. In doing so, Skigaj affirms that Herbert was able to successfully blend ecological wisdom with Eastern philosophy in an unprecedented manner. History and Historical Effect in Frank Herbert's Dune by Lorenzo Di Tommaso is concerned only with the first Dune novel, and advances ideas in a similar mode to Skigage's examination of Prana. De Tommaso argues that history and historical effect play a major role in the grounding and development of the numerous plots in Dune. This in turn advances what he terms the vitality struggle as a predominant theme. This vitality struggle is as de Tommaso views it, the clash between the differing philosophies of the Imperium and those who live on Arrakis. Indeed, 
As one of the few historical approaches to Herbert's Dune, De Tommaso is correct that religious history serves the function of allowing the evolution of two of Herbert's major themes in the books, namely that of ecology and the dangers of the messianic hero. Although he mentions a number of the institutions which are formed out of this history, the realisation of the primacy of the Butlerian Jihad in this is not fully realised. Nevertheless, De Tommaso's study is interesting and certainly approaches the history of the Dune universe in an intriguing manner. However, he views Paul as a product of the historical forces created out of the Butlerian Jihad. This is contrary to the view that Paul is a product of the evolutionary and religious changes instigated by humanity's stagnation and subsequent oppression by highly evolved machines. In this sense, history is a key component to understanding the Dune series, but it is a history moulded out of the need for evolutionary change, and the event that creates this nexus is the Butlerian Jihad. Aside from these articles and studies, there also exist examinations of Herbert's Dune series in the form of study guides, produced by Spark Notes on Dune, Frank Herbert, 2002, and Cliff Notes on Herbert's Dune and Other Works, published in 1975, both of which fail to approach the whole series. The Cliff Notes does, however, provide an interesting and insightful look at a number of Frank Herbert's early novels, which are often ignored in the shadow of his Dune series. It is my intention to investigate Frank Herbert's opus Dune and the subsequent novels that make up this unusual epic masterpiece. My objective is to study the key themes of this series as a focal point for an examination of this work as a deliberately subversive undertaking that seeks to undermine the stagnant nature of Golden Age science fiction. I intend to show how Frank Herbert does this through a desire to write science fiction in a proper literary medium and undermine the tropes that had found their way into American science fiction since the late 1930s and early 40s. Frank Herbert in creating the Dune series reverts to themes and extrapolations from Victorian science fiction works and uses them as a historical and evolutionary foundation for his novels. In connection with his desire to undermine the tropes becoming common in Campbellian science fiction, I also intend to illustrate how Herbert connects his themes to the broader contemporary political and cultural spheres of 1960s America. In doing so, and in particular wishing to highlight the dangers of blind obedience to political leaders, together with their desire to use ecology as a staging platform for their careers, Herbert had created a story that not only resonated with the counterculture and the growing environmental movement of the 1960s, he also created a work whose political and ecological message continues to resonate with the public today. By this achievement, Frank Herbert has created an enduring narrative that continues to remain both critically acclaimed and popular over 50 years since its publication. I also intend to discuss Herbert's Dune and its place in science fiction and examine its separation within the genre and demonstrate that it is essentially a Janus facing work. By this I mean that Dune can be seen as both facing backwards to the golden age of science fiction and ahead to the subsequent new wave. Yet Dune's subversive nature ensured that as a work of science fiction, it stands alone and unique within the genre. I will demonstrate this by examining Herbert's interest in Jungian psychology, the concept of the monomyth, and how he applied these theories to his concerns about what he called disastrous heroes and the messianic impulse which overtakes civilization. In the wake of World War II, he saw this as a disconcerting and repeatable trend in human society, and his concerns also looked to the kinds of heroes that science fiction was producing as protagonists at the time. Before beginning this study, I think it's both fitting and wise to provide some brief insight into our understanding of both Frank Herbert and the field of science fiction. For that reason in this introductory chapter, I will present some brief biographical material on Frank Herbert in order to help get a better understanding of this complex writer. I will also provide an overview of the science fiction of the times, in particular the influence of John W. Campbell on what we refer to as the golden age of science fiction. In many ways Herbert was a great advocate for science fiction, but early in his writing career he had not intended to remain in this genre, knowing as he did that it was considered a literary ghetto by many. Herbert was ultimately iconoclastic towards what we call the golden age of science fiction in his attempts to undermine the stereotypical pulp science fiction which had developed 
In particular, the science fiction protagonist which had emerged out of the late 1930s and early 1940s ideal of the Edisonian hero led to what we referred to as the Van Vautian hero. This was a central focus for Frank Herbert's attack, and also mirrored his concerns regarding real life political and religious leadership. His work represents a paradigm shift in the approach adopted for writing in the genre, which would ultimately steer science fiction away from its pulp origins and help it not only to be taken more seriously as a form of literature, but also to act as a kind of vanguard for the new wave of the 1960s and 70s. In a sense the new wave was perceived as a very British phenomenon, centred on New Worlds magazine, but there are a few exceptions in American science fiction, notably the work of Judith Merrill which itself would help spark Harlan Ellison's dangerous visions. Frank Herbert's Dune also marks the beginnings of a new wave in American science fiction which indicated a distinct change for science fiction on the whole. It is for this reason that Brian Aldiss in Trillion Year Spree describes Dune in the context of marking a rebirth of sorts for science fiction, bringing it into a new modern period. That the best science fiction being written today is an improvement on the crude science fiction of the early magazines. That it has acquired many skills and graces, possibly at the expense of new ideas. That we are now in the modern period of science fiction, the birth of which may be dated roughly from the first publication of June in 1963 to 64, which period exhibits many of the same traits as does the modern novel, in terms of amplification and sophistication at the expense of innovation. That there remains much to be admired as well as much to be deplored. That recent achievements are real and to be praised. Our perspective is a positive and forward looking one as we hope will be acknowledged.